right, guys, the next set of notes, um, we're going to cover air pressure, um, the relationship between air pressure and a couple of things, and we'll also talk about the environment. So what exactly is air pressure? Now, air pressure means the same thing as atmospheric pressure. So if you hear someone talk about atmospheric pressure, it's the same thing as air pressure. Um, air pressure just refers to the amount of weight of our atmosphere that's pressing down on everything at the surface. So right now, there's air pressure pushing down on you. Um, something you need to know is that air does have weight and that the force of molecules in motion is what causes air pressure. So if you have all of these molecules in motion pushing down, that's what's going to be causing all this air pressure. So all the pressure that's in the air is these force of molecules that are in motion. There's three things that affect air pressure, and that is humidity, altitude, and temperature. I refer to this acronym as HAT. Okay, it helps you remember humidity, altitude, temperature. Now, as humidity, altitude, or temperature goes up, air pressure is going to do the opposite and go down. So if there's high humidity, altitude, or temperature, your air pressure is going to be doing the opposite and going down. So they three have an opposite relationship with air pressure. Let's start with humidity. Humidity is defined as the amount of moisture in the air. So if it's a day where it's getting real thick outside and real muggy and you feel like a storm's coming or about to come through, then that typically means that there's high humidity. So there's a lot of water vapor in the air. Now, if it's a nice, clean, clear, crisp day and, you know, it's not hard to breathe outside, then you would say that that's low humidity. There's not a lot of water vapor or moisture in the air. Um, so if you look over here at the picture, it has the desert, which is dry, so you know that there's low humidity. Now, because humidity, altitude, and temperature all have an opposite relationship, humidity is down, which means air pressure is up. Now, in the next picture, you have what looks kind of like a rainforest. There's high humidity, lots of water vapor in the air here. So, pressure is going to be the opposite and go down. Okay, opposite relationship here. So, I talked about how air has weight, and I'm going to describe that for you right now. And something really cool um, for you guys to see is that water vapor actually weighs less than air molecules. Most people think that if it's water vapor, it's got water, it's going to be heavy, um, but I'm going to tell you how that's not the case. So we know that air contains oxygen and we know that air contains nitrogen. So oxygen is represented as O2 in the air and um, oxygen's atomic mass is 16. Well, since there's two oxygen molecules, you multiply it and you get a total of 32 for oxygen. Um, nitrogen's also in the air. Its atomic mass is 14, but in the air, nitrogen is represented as N2, so it's 14 times 2, which is 28. So we have oxygen at 32 and nitrogen at 28. Water vapor is also part of our air, um, and it's made of only one oxygen, which is 16, and two hydrogens, and hydrogen's atomic mass is only one. So, oxygen comes in at 32, nitrogen comes in at 28, and when you add up the hydrogen and oxygen in water vapor, that only comes up to 18, which means it is less than all of these other gases in the air. Okay, so water vapor weighs less than air molecules. Um, something I already told you guys is air becomes more humid, air pressure goes down, okay? Moist air is going to weigh less than dry air, believe it or not. Um, dew point is a term that you need to make sure you know, and the dew point is um, described as whenever air cools to its dew point through contact with a surface that's colder than the air, the water is going to condense on that surface, so you're going to see dew drops, just like um, in the mornings when there's a morning dew. There's the little drops on the grass or on the bushes outside. That means that it reached the dew point to where water is going to condense on a surface. Altitude is the second thing that has that opposite relationship with air pressure. So the higher you go up in altitude, you climb high, there's less air pressure on top of you. However, if you climb lower towards the ocean, there's more air pressure pushing down on you. And I can show you a really good example. So if you're way up here on this mountain, you got this much air pressure pushing down on you. So your altitude is high, your air pressure is low. Now let's say you go all the way down here at the bottom of your mountain. 
Now you have all of this air pressure on top of you. So there's more air pressure, so higher air pressure, at lower altitudes, opposite relationship. There's lower air pressure at higher altitudes, opposite relationship. Temperature is the third thing that has an opposite relationship with air pressure. So as your temperature goes up and as it gets hotter, okay, air pressure is going to go lower. Same thing, if it gets colder and your temperature goes down, air pressure is going to go up. They will always do the opposite. Now, a good way to look at this is when you consider molecules. So if you have a hot object, like in this picture right here where it says warm air, whenever it's hot, you'll see that the molecules are far apart, okay? They're spaced out really far apart. So whenever something's hot or whenever you're hot, you don't want people up on you. You kind of want your space. Um, so you're all spread apart. Same thing with temperature molecules. Hot molecules, they're going to be far apart. Okay, and so there's less pressure on those molecules. Now the opposite's true for cold air. When you're cold, you kind of want to cuddle up and warm up and huddle and keep each other warm, okay? So you have all these molecules and they're all up on each other. They're all close. Um, so because they're so close, they're higher in pressure, all right? So cold air, the temperature goes down, the pressure goes up. Opposite relationship. Now we're going to move on to three types of um, environmental issues. We're going to talk about resource use, we're going to talk about pollution, um, and we're going to talk about population growth, which I said out of order, but they're all three important, so we'll talk about them. For resource use, you have to know what a resource is. A resource is defined as anything in our environment that we use, okay? It can either be renewable or non-renewable. If it's renewable, it's going to be available and it's going to be naturally replaced in a short amount of time. So if you're using sunlight and you have solar panels on your house, then those solar panels are gathering the light from the sun and using that as energy for your house. That's going to be replenished or naturally replaced every day when the sun's out, okay? So that's a renewable resource. It gets renewed. Same with water and wind. Now, non-renewable resources are resources that are going to be burnt out. So once we use them all, they can't be replaced in a useful time frame. So once you drill for oil and you've drilled all the oil out of a certain area, then guess what? It's not going to magically come back in the area and renew itself. It's a non-renewable resource. The next thing is population growth. So why do we care that population is increasing so much? Um, the main reason is because the demand for resources has increased. So because we have more people, we now have um, the demand for more food. We need more jobs. We need more places to live. We need more water. So in the example of water, whenever you have a water shortage, towns are going to restrict water use because the areas that are growing so fast in population, they don't have the facilities to supply this water for all these people. So, like, a couple of years ago when Cary was really um, blowing up and so many people were moving to Cary, they were restricting when people in Cary could water their lawns or when they could um, wash their cars. And if you washed your car or watered your lawn on a day that you weren't supposed to, then there would be a penalty for that. Okay, and that's because whenever you have such high population growth, you're going to have resource shortages. Pollution was the third thing, and it's defined as the contamination of land, water, or air, okay? Any of those three that's contaminated, that's considered pollution. Um, the main thing that you guys hear about is whenever we burn fossil fuels. Um, so whenever we are burning gasoline or oil or coal, all of these things release pollutants into the air. Um, so we use gasoline to drive cars. So there are more cars on the road, the more gas that we're using, the more pollutants released in the air. So let's say a population growth is happening and several people move into an area. That means there's more people that now need to be fed as well. So we need to use more fertilizer and more chemicals to be put on our crops to produce food that's viable for people to eat. Well, what happens to these chemicals when it rains? It runs off the land and it pollutes the bodies of water. So here's all our chemicals running off the land. And then it lands into this big body of water where we get our water supply from. Okay? Big issue. That's severe pollution in the water. 
So how do we decide what's good for us and what's bad for us and whether or not it's going to make us money or if it's going to hurt the environment too much? Well, we have to balance those needs. So we have to look at the pros and cons of the situation. And all of this falls under the category of environmental science. Environmental science is defined as the study of natural processes in the environment and how we as humans affect those processes. So when we have a situation at hand, we have to balance the pros and cons. We have to look at the different opinions on the environmental issues. So we look at things that will make us money, things that will help our economy, but we also have to look at things about the environment, okay? Whether it's going to harm the environment, whether it's going to be good for the environment. So if you're trying to decide if you should cut down tons of trees to build um, a new neighborhood. Well, obviously, if you cut down the trees, that's going to change the ecosystems. And it's also going to get rid of the habitat for animals, which is a negative thing. Um, but if we're cutting down trees, we're giving somebody a job. Somebody's cutting down the trees. And then we're going to build houses, which can give a place for people to live. So you have to weigh the pros and cons or the costs and benefits. So think about this situation. What are the costs of drilling oil in Antarctica? Okay, it could be expensive to get equipment down there. It could be dangerous. Um, we could have an oil spill. What are the benefits? It gives people jobs. It gives us a resource to sell and make money off of. So you have to figure out what's more important, the negatives or the positives. So moving on to the last couple of things, we'll start with the ozone and how it impacts us. So you learn that the ozone layer protects us from um, harmful UV rays, and it's in the stratosphere. So the stratosphere pretty much soaks up these UV rays and prevents it from giving us severe sunburns or eye disease or skin cancer. Um, but you have to know that it can be helpful or hurtful depending on where it's located. So if it's on Earth's surface, so in our troposphere where we are, it's a pollutant, okay? It's considered smog, which is smoke and fog. It's harmful to us. But if it's higher in the atmosphere, like the stratosphere, where we can't breathe it in, it's helpful because it blocks harmful UV rays from getting down to our surface. So just for a background knowledge, the source of ozone, ozone's created whenever sunlight hits an ozone molecule. So that molecule will then break into an oxygen molecule and an oxygen atom, and they'll just bond with other oxygen atoms and molecules and form new ozone molecules. So whenever the sunlight gets absorbed by this ozone, it doesn't reach our surface, which is a good thing. Now there is such thing as something called the ozone hole, and we began noticing it in the 70s whenever oxygen started thinning in Antarctica, um, which means the amount of ozone was decreasing and letting our oxygen escape from our atmosphere, and in turn letting the harmful UV rays in our atmosphere. So we figured out what caused it, and the major cause was CFCs, which were a human-made gas called chlorofluorocarbons. Um, we were using these and creating these gases in air conditioners and aerosol cans like hairspray or room spray, um, and it was releasing these human-made gases into the atmosphere and eating a hole in the ozone. So how exactly it works is whenever CFCs got up in the atmosphere and hit those ozone molecules that were absorbing harmful UV rays, it blocked the absorption of UV light. So now these molecules couldn't absorb the light and it was now coming down into our troposphere. So what we did about it was we signed an agreement to not use CFCs and almost all of them were banned in year 2000. Now some CFCs are still used, um, but most don't reach our atmosphere because we've done so much work with them to figure out um, how to prevent it from being harmful. Now unfortunately some of those really harmful CFCs remain in our atmosphere from when we used them years and years ago. Um, but we have been using technology to decrease the amount of CFCs that are released from our man-made machines. For global climate change, things that affect the climate, there are two things that affect the climate, and that's the greenhouse effect and global warming. When you think of the greenhouse effect, I want you to think of a greenhouse. So a greenhouse is this big area where you're growing plants. It's really hot and muggy in there. It, like, traps the heat. That's the exact thing as the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is the trapping of heat near our surface, okay? So... What happens is water vapor, carbon dioxide, other gases kind of act as windows to the atmosphere because it allows this light to come down and hit our surface. But these things prevent that heat and light from escaping into space. 
Now, too much of these gases could lead to too much heat being trapped, okay? And that means our atmosphere would then absorb UV radiation released by Earth, and it would get super hot where we're at. Now, the one benefit to the greenhouse effect is that without it, our planet would be much colder, and all of our water would be in frozen form. And we all know that we need water as a liquid form to survive. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. The second thing is global warming, which is just a prediction that the increase in carbon dioxide will cause average temperatures to rise. So I say this is a prediction because some people believe it and some people don't, and it hasn't necessarily been proven. So all you need to know is the basics. That because of activities such as coal and oil burning, like the burning of fossil fuels, um, carbon dioxide amounts have increased drastically, and they're still increasing. So it's our human activities that are increasing carbon dioxide, um, and this could be increasing the greenhouse effect. So what would happen if these temperatures do rise? Well, Antarctica, which is our cold area, they have ice caps, and these ice caps would melt, and that would cause a raise in ocean levels, which would cause flooding in low-lying areas. So all of our beach towns would be gone underwater. Um, climate patterns would also be disrupted and change where we could grow crops. It would also cause an increase in bad weather. So our hurricanes that get all their energy um, from the warm ocean waters they would get lots of energy because those temperatures would just keep increasing and we would have severe weather. Um, why it's so difficult to predict these climate changes and know exactly what it is is causing them is because systems are so complex. So we have all these natural things like volcanoes and forests and oceans, and they all affect carbon dioxide levels as well as what humans do. So it's hard to pinpoint how each of these factors are going to affect the climate. Now, we do have computer models to help our scientists predict these changes, but it's hard to say how accurate um, they really are when we have all these factors playing into it. So that's all I have for you guys. If you have any questions, come to me in class. Thanks.